this is the Roaring Elephant Podcast for the 5th of April 2017, a podcast about Apache Hadoop and the surrounding ecosystem for anyone working with or investigating big data. My name is Dave, and here is my co-host as always, Jon. Hello Dave, welcome to Germany. Indeed, welcome to Germany. Welcome to slightly overcast Munich. Well, the drapes are closed now, so I can't see a thing, but I trust you because you're by the window. Yeah, if I peek out the window, it's actually dark. So, yes, we are in Munich. We are here for the Day to Work Summit. This is our special edition, one of two, hopefully, um, sort of single-day retrospectives where we, we reflect back on the sessions we've attended or not attended. And, uh, <laughs> as the case may be. As the case may be. Specifically for Dave. <laughs> and generally give, give our impressions of uh, how the day's been, uh, how we found it, what we're looking forward to tomorrow, and uh, even possibly a few snippets from people that we spoke to along the way. Um, other things that we uh, need to make sure our audience is fully enlightened about is, uh, of course, we are now in the running for the San Jose um, Summit. So we need to make sure that uh, you're retweeting our episodes and getting those entries into our raffle. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then please go and listen to the previous episode. If you've That's listened a good idea to that, anyway. Absolutely it is. If you've listened to that and you're still not sure what I'm, looking, I'm talking about, please go and check the uh, competition uh, rules that are on our website and you can find out more about how you can enter a pass, uh, enter a competition even, a raffle, to get a free pass to the San Jose DataWorks Summit sponsored by Hortonworks. So thank you, Hortonworks, for the free pass. Thank you, Hortonworks. Um, and on that note... Anything else for you to add, Jan? Um, yeah, I want to thank the people that actually answered to my little Twitter poll about uh, sharks versus turtles. If you don't understand that one, again, go to the last episode to figure <laughs> out what I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, apparently at this point, the sharks are ruling. So Indeed. if there are any turtles out there, speak up or lose your chance. Now, what Dave hasn't mentioned is that we are... Uh, putting this episode out earlier than normal, because normally we should have a new episode next Tuesday. But we're at the Hadoop Summit, sorry, the Data Work Summit. I'm going to make this mistake a lot of times in this episode, no problem there. But we're going to do same-day episodes, which means that we won't be doing an episode next Tuesday. So sorry for the disappointment, but instead of having one episode next Tuesday, we're getting two episodes this week. Indeed. So Enjoy. You should get out ahead, right? <clears throat> and with that, let's get into the main subject. After the music, because you wanted the music, because you like the music, is the best part of the show. This is the best part of the show. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to expect that uh, it's going to be a very good first day. I'm looking forward to the keynotes. Um, and uh, I already saw a ni some nice uh, uh, sessions uh, being planned. We are beginners to Hadoop. We'll learn about the core concepts of the technologies in HBase. We are uh, very interested on HBase. A couple of people that we've brought along are, are fairly new, uh, new to Hadoop. So it's a, a, a good introduction for them. In fact, one person just joined our team. Uh, just a couple of days ago, so it, it, it's quite a learning curve, and um, so there's a lot of value uh, for us in, in that. We like to see uh, what's new, as we're in Europe, it's all about, for us, governance and security. Yeah, we're looking forward to see some interesting stuff from uh, the Hadoop side. Um, we personally are using Spark and uh, Hive and so on, and uh, we're looking forward to see some new uh, developments, or uh, at least how we can apply the technologies to our use cases. We also want to look to see what things are, are coming up over the next year so that we can pay more uh, attention to, to those. So just the main intention, to interact with the electronic people, to know what problem they face, how they solve the problem. Yeah. You know, the problem is there's too many things at the same time. Some kind of technical questions that we wanted to take in person with some of the people who... Uh, are on the project teams themselves to um, uh, to see if we can discuss what kind of problems that we're having. Uh, these are the things that we want to do, and do they have any suggestions for how we might 
go about that? I was um, uh, in Dublin as well. Okay. Um, and in Amsterdam. Okay. So I'm, uh, You're uh, a veteran already. I'm a veteran already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. No, it's good. It's good to see. It's good to, that you see many familiar faces. Um, so it really feels like a community yeah. rather than just an event that is vendor pushed. And welcome back. After that very short introduction, we're now going to go in uh, chronological order, I guess, of the agenda we uh, attended this, uh, today. That's right. And at the end, we're going to have a little summary of the whole event. So, uh, as usual in these things, the day started with a keynote presentation, a very long keynote presentation with multiple people speaking, even a panel in there. It was introduced by John Kreischer, which was a marketing guy from uh, Hortworks, I think. Which uh, I let's, 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 before, before oh the intro, before oh, no, the don't intro. Talk about that. Oh, come on. Oh, come man. on. Okay, go ahead. So, before anyone started speaking, there was a laser show. <laughs> and, you know, what can I say? I'm a geek. I like lasers. It, this was a very, I thought, pretty impressive laser show. And for those of you that uh, that were there, I hope you enjoyed it too. For those of you that weren't there, um, think lasers. Think music that's somewhere between the soundtrack to Batman Begins and Terminator. So... Angry, sort of mm. powerful, um, <laughs> great. Anyway, I I was thoroughly mesmerized. Um, it wasn't necessarily the best part of the day, but it was pretty good. It was impressive, I'll say that. But I was sitting at a certain point when I had all of these lasers shining right in my, in my eyes. It was a little <laughs> bit disconcerting at first, but at a, at a certain point you get blinded, you don't see anything anymore. So anyway, so I didn't see half of the show, I'm afraid. Ah, oh, well, there you go. And, and, that's just me. And, uh, and Jan is now uh, tapping his cane around the room uh, just to make his way to the microphone. So I'm doing everything I can to keep the dog silent. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> Anyway, it was a nice uh, show. Although last year's Dublin, the little um, uh, floating balls they had there. That was also that was cool. more original. Soothing. It was soothing. It was very soothing. Yeah, but that was Ireland, right? Irish music, this is Germany, or more Ram- Rammstein and stuff. Like that. So <laughs> it's a different kind of culture, uh, right? I, I didn't uh, do Haas, no. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I thought that was great. And then, yes, as you say, John Chrysler stepped up and uh, I guess, you know, compared, kicked off the various different sessions uh, throughout the keynote. Yeah, we both made some notes here, so you're probably going to have to wait for us from time to time just checking on the notes we made. This is a live show, so it's going to be a little less pre-prepared than, than we usually do, <laughs> also <laughs> acoustically. <laughs> yeah, not that these things are particularly <laughs> polished anyway, but hey. <laughs> well, we, we usually try harder than what we can do with the meager resources at our disposal here, So, but we're going to try to do our best, indeed, as we always do. So a couple of things that I noted that John Chrysler talked about were uh, there were more than 1,400 people registered. This was yep. apparently uh, the biggest European uh, Hortonworks to do summit, data works summit, thing. whatever you <laughs> call it, uh, yep. until now. So the community is still growing. Yep, yep. And I've actually had a little conversation along the, during the day with uh, a couple of people from Hortonworks who actually confirmed that they've surpassed uh, the, the attendance. So. They didn't want to tell me how many there were. <laughs> I'm assuming they're going to have a blog post out of it about yeah, that in the next week or so. So apparently this thing is still growing, which is yeah. good. It's good for us because it means more listeners possible. Indeed. Hmm. And uh, and out of those so 1,400 or so uh, attendees, you know, out, that was spread across 60-plus countries, which I think is, is fantastic. Yep. Um, and the other port point I thought was quite interesting was the uh, number of um, submissions for sessions yeah. over 340 submissions uh, from over 112 companies so not only is it still growing but the diversity is still increasing as yeah, well yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that's great numbers great numbers yeah, and if you know that only 78 sessions were kept for the two days yeah that's uh, I mean it's hard to get in there isn't it it is it is we can definitely verify that <laughs> so I mean, really, things uh, things initially <coughs> kicked off with uh, Scott Now, um, CTO for Hortonworks, and um, really, to me, this was kind of a this was not a revolutionary um, no. uh, keynote at all. In fact, the the whole keynote really um, it was it was more a quiet evolution. It was um, you know reinforcing a lot of the messages that you know personally I'd been hearing. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. fairly continuously yep. from and including the last Hadoop Summit, DataWorks Summit, as is now. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the echoing things like this is the perfect storm, which is the, the message that we keep kind of hearing. And I do kind of agree with. We are in that time sure. where 
um, yeah, all these things are, are, are aligning and, and it is kind of making sense. Um, yeah, and he, he brought up a number of different themes, again, that we, we all hear now on a fairly mm-hmm. regular basis with cloud and IoT and streaming and you know, data creating new business models and connected data platforms versus converged mm-hmm. systems and all these kind of things. Yeah, but maybe all had to us, but uh, as you just mentioned, a lot of new people are attending these summits. Yeah. And for those people, I've talked to a number of people who this was their first summit that they just started doing this thing. And for them, this is still new. So, yes, not revolutionary, but a nice introduction, getting people in from a starting point, just getting up to speed to what yep. the current situation is. So from that yep. point of view, I can understand why they did it that way. Yeah. yeah. Now, we did go on by going across the four, the, the, the different use cases in manufacturing and uh, a couple of other things, which I thought was a bit too much detail for a keynote. But again, as an introduction situation, nah, it's not bad. Yeah. Like I think and his, his final message was really about uh, um, about the future. And the fact that uh, you know, as, as far as uh, as far as he was concerned, we, the future was here. We were in in the future today, which doesn't necessarily make grammatical sense. But uh, hey, however, however it works. If you're gonna nitpick, then I've got one from John Kreischer just before Scott now started because he had it a phrase about the hoodies versus the suits. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's politically correct, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. And I'm not sure which category I put myself there either. So but anyway. maybe, you're, maybe you're a suit wearing hoodie or a hoodie wearing suit. Yeah, well, I was incognito anyway, so who cares? <laughs> Nobody recognised me today. <laughs> well, apart from the giant yellow um, roaring elephant fleece you were wearing, as I, was I as, as was I, as was I. Anyway, moving on. Moving on. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, next uh, sort of uh, presenter during the keynote was um, Terry Vernig from uh, IBM, uh, representing largely representing the power division, although um, open, IBM Open Power. Although um, her session did kind of uh, meander across some of the other offerings that IBM obviously have um, in the uh, multi tentacled octopus that is IBM uh, across things like Watson. Mm-hmm. Um, the storage area that they deal with, with open power um, and a variety of other areas as well. And it seemed to be, um, you know, the message was very focused and kept kind of touching back on what they were doing with power and, you know, the power ecosystem and open power generally. Um, But also, you know, generally very focused on, you know, machine learning and AI and its influence on... Well, that was the focus of of her little speech, right? Yeah, Yeah. and that focus on big data. Yeah, but they also had a huge focus on IBM being the open source company of the future, let's say. Because as you repeat it, yeah. I see, Dave's making a face at me. You can't see this, but I'm behind me, this is a voice face. Only. He's lying. He, li- <laughs> he lies, dear audience. He lies. No, but it was a big emphasis. He kept repeating that that they were opening all of the technologies, open sourcing this, open sourcing that. Now, in my opinion, IBM is more open than it used to be. Yeah, much but, like your own employer, Microsoft. Uh, much like Microsoft, although I might know Microsoft from the inside, I don't know IBM from the inside, so sure. I can't really compare the two. But the it was a message about being open, but a very commercial message about being open. So uh, proofs in the pudding. So we need to f- see what IBM is going to do with this. If they're serious about this, that might open a lot of good things in the future. So I really hope that this is something they're standing behind. Mm-hmm. But as with a huge company like that, it's always hard to to see where it's going to happen before it actually happens. Yeah. But they did give big emphasis on that and a big emphasis on their uh, relation with Hortonworks. Yeah. Yeah, That's indeed. The other keynote, the other guest, we didn't touch on that too much, but uh, Terry, if I'm not mistaken, was Terry right, her first name? Yeah. yeah. She really went out and said, we have a good relationship with Hortonworks and we're doing things together, having HTTP on their open power or whatever, eight or something. Not so good in hardware anymore since I'm on the cloud these days. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was the two things I remembered mostly from her speech, the, the whole thing about IBM being open which is, I guess, open source is showing IBM the way. Yeah, yeah. Which is good. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, the next kind of section of the keynote was a panel session um, chaired by Sean Connolly. And then we had uh, uh, Owen O'Malley, one of the uh, founders of Fortworks, 
Simon Ball representing um, some of the areas of uh, product management like uh, cybersecurity and some areas of data science. And all, also uh, Daljit Rihal from um, Centrica, mm-hmm. aka British Gas. Um, and uh, I mean, this to me was uh, it was a little bit of a fluff session. Um, it, it did come across as a little bit um, possibly overly scripted. Although, you know, with these kind of panel sessions in front of a sizable audience, mm-hmm. it's difficult to uh, to imagine. Um, how you would do it any other way. Um, but there were, uh, I mean, I'll just pick out a few pieces um, during the session that I thought were particularly good. Um, uh, one of them was around, um, uh, you know, around security generally and the impact of uh, open source on security and, you know, how you can be secure with open source. Mm-hmm. And I, I must admit, prop, props to Simon Hat off. Um, his response, I thought, was was brilliant because his response was essentially he didn't believe that you can actually do security without open source. You know that you know more eyes on the code, full peer review. Exactly. The the just the the things that open source brings to uh, software it are unparalleled and unmatched by the proprietary software world. So couldn't agree more. I thought that was a that was a for me that was the one of the little gems out of that panel session. How about you? Uh, yeah, I'd concur with that. I mean, uh, Daljeet from Centrica then went on about how they co- are cooperating with a local university that they have a new master's degree which Centrica is sponsoring so they get an easy exchange of students doing their internships with Centrica and stuff and how that enabled Centrica themselves to change their business view on how to treat new hires, which was a nice touch, I think, yeah. instead of saying to new hires, okay, this is what you learn in school, that's very nice, but here's how we do it. Yeah. That that doesn't work anymore. You have to keep get these people in with the knowledge they gained in a practical fashion because of those internships in real live environments. That they, they have experience today, so let them just use what they know and as long as they get the job done, that's fine. Yeah. So less of that static regimental approach. This is what you do, left, right, left, right. Okay, you do it this way. Fair, go ahead. Yeah. I must admit I that I agree that part was quite nice and in fact the 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 approach being uh, more focused on you know these people are coming out of university with a whole bunch of skills why on earth would we then send them on a bunch of SAS training courses yeah. you know it, if they come out with all of this knowledge of you know Scala or R or you know whatever else it might be then why not just utilize that? Yeah. So, Especially since commercial entities at the moment can't keep up with the, with the evolutions. And most of the evolution is happening in the academic world. Yeah. So mostly today, the, 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 the guys leaving school, they know the relevant stuff. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're as current, if not more current, than yeah. a lot of the guys in the enterprise. Which is great news for anybody starting in the, the big, big data Hadoop environment world. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a good career path to to embark on yeah yeah. future is bright for that indeed on to the next well I just want to mention one more thing there was some talk about blockchain as well uh, there's also Daljeet and Daljeet had most of the interesting things to say (laughs) for some reason for me but he was like I've I've been struggling to finding a a use case for blockchain I mean it's a nice tech but what the hell are you going to do with it Mm. and he had a nice thing which I I wrote down about uh, having electrical cars with the batteries on Heathrow parking spaces just standing there for a week wouldn't it be nice if you could just sell your energy in the car to the local hospital and make some money and when you come back into the country well, recharge a car in, in time to be able to move out again, but don't have that energy just standing still there. The only way you can make that work is by having a network of trust. You can't just go to a bank or a notary public or something like that, and a blockchain solution would actually make sense there. So yeah. that kind of was a nice... Uh, I, I finally have a use case where blockchain makes sense that doesn't involve, involve bitcoins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, that was, the, that was the, uh, the concept of the virtual power station, which is, I must admit, yeah, that was, that was pretty that was cool. A, it was a nice one. It was a, it was a nice image, so... Yeah. So no, even though you started out by saying there was a bit of a uh, meek <laughs> panel session, I agreed. But now we're talking about it. We did pick some stuff up. You're there. right. You're right. So I sit corrected. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we are sitting. That's true. Anyway, moving on. We then had Asad Khan from Microsoft actually make an appearance, mm-hmm. and I was kind of happily surprised. It wasn't. I mean, Microsoft 
does not always have the most engaging presentations when they do it, but this guy actually went hands-on. <laughs> Indeed. I, I'm, I'm guessing that he'd drawn those things on his surface. <laughs> Quite possibly. That's what the things are made for, although Microsoft does have a big marketing department, so I wouldn't guarantee it. <laughs> but uh, it was a bit of a mystery when he came on the stage with a little white box on the, on the chair, not showing what was in there. Yeah, I, I was afraid of handguns, but it turned out it was fine. <laughs> this is not America, this is Germany. <laughs> <laughs> that would turn out to be a little drone where he got a, a kind of a hobby project, let's call it, where he put more sensors on it to do yeah, machine learning, real-time yeah. analytics with uh, sensor data from the drone stuff. So that was, uh, was kind of nice. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. And uh, I, I particularly liked one of the one of the images during his, uh, his session was that of a... Uh, now, he used the word food processor, <laughs> um, but actually, anyone that that really knew what it was, it, it's a a meat grinder, and uh, you know, and which he, is a kind of food processor. It's a kind of food <laughs> processor, but I think we should be a little bit more specific. But anyway, so he was describing you know a meat grinder in the context of um, essentially an ETL pipeline, and it was a. It, I must admit that was very well done. It was a, it was a perfect fit for that. So yeah, it was yeah it was it was a nice nice presentation. Um, yeah, I, I I also like the drone. Uh, for those that, uh, that that weren't able to attend, he was unfortunately unable to fly yeah. the, the drone <laughs> due to health and safety uh, issues slash concerns. Um, but those uh, which, people never want us to have any fun, do they? I know, I know, I know. What is it <laughs> about kidding, all these? Right, right. What is it about all these health and safety people? Anyway, but um, he, did, he did propose to do the next Hadoop's, uh, sorry, Data Work Summit in open air. I hope they do it somewhere sunny. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe Spain. Spain would be good. We could we could do it. Yeah, I've heard some rumors, and the rumors I've heard aren't Spain. So okay, all right. So possibly no <laughs> no open air Colosseum um, data works. Oh, to the Italy in the big. Yeah, uh, yeah that would be nice. Yeah. See, there we go. Are you at Hortonworks? Make it happen. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and then winding up the keynote, as, yeah. as at least I remember it. Thing I was looking forward to most, actually, because usually in the keynotes the uh, luminary person has the most well. The speech that stays in my mind longest was yeah. usually a bit more thought provoking and stuff. Yeah. Uh, this time it wasn't bad, but I can't say I was as enthused by what he was saying than last year, for example. Yeah. Yeah, um, so it was uh, Dr. Barry Devlin from uh, Nine Site Computing, and he consulting even. Oh, um, <laughs> one of the three. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure it's consulting. Um, and he was basically talking about the fact that we were in um, uh, a, a period of threshold moments when we were transitioning across, and uh, essentially, you know, the, the the growth of of AI and automation and machine learning. Uh, and the this again perfect storm of of other considerations that are happening would essentially mean that eventually we are uh, humans are all replaced by robots and uh, you know what do you do when that happens and so there were a, a few sort of uh, options discussed whether it's uh, uh, you know uh, auto, uh, automated uh, devices do replace all our jobs in which case maybe you just get a uh, a fixed salary enough to put food on the table and then you spend more time improving yourself, improving your life for your family and other things. Um, it also kind of meandered onto the uh, um, sort of some of the areas of uh, whether decision making should be completely replaced by AI or whether you should just have um, augmented uh, mm-hmm. decision making. So still driven by humans, but they're given a, you know, a more accurate, fuller picture yeah. of things. The augmented versus automated was even broader than just the decision-making things, but just also the manufacturing thing. You can replace the human by a robot, or you can have a human assisted by technology being able to make the human do better things. Yeah. And his conclusion, if you can call it that, was basically that augmentation would be better for the... I don't know, Gestalt, I guess, by yep. lack of a better word. Yep. Uh, word. <laughs> but uh, the economic, economic uh, pressures will probably not allow augmentation to fulfill itself because automation is economically more viable. Yeah, Economics 101 suggests that uh, we'll all be out of the jobs eventually. So, uh, which is a are. bad thing because if we're out <laughs> of jobs, we don't have money to buy things, so we yep. don't need people to make things because nobody's buying the things, and that's where capitalism apparently um, Eats itself. evaporates. Yeah. Eats itself, collapses. Anyway, it was a, it was a, it was a perfectly adequate session on ethics, community, yeah. 
But it was again a session on ethics. It's again about you can do good and bad with this data. And you, the I think you call the 0.1%, which are the, not the experts, but the people with the knowledge about this thing. It's, on, it's up to you to make this right. I mean, yeah, we do have some influence, I guess, but I don't think I'm that important that I can really <laughs> change the world on this level. Now, I grant you, if we all think like this, if we're also pessimistic as I apparently am, that's not a good thing either, then nothing happens, I agree. But it's like, how much pressure do you want to put on us poor data people here? <laughs> <laughs> Give us a break, man. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. And uh, so that was it for the keynote, really. Wound things up, and then it was... Off to sessions. Well, it was off to the first break first. Well, true. And then off to sessions, <laughs> or at least off to sessions for some of us. Uh, so my day-to-day was a series of uh, customer meetings interspersed by sessions. So unfortunately, I was unable to attend quite as many sessions as Jan, um, but uh, I will certainly comment as and when. Yes, I went ahead and fulfilled my roaring elephant duties and faithfully went to every session. That's right. Because uh, Jan's just uh, slumming it here, slacking away, <laughs> and uh, just uh, hiding from real work. Anyway, carry on, Jan. Hiding what was from your... real world? That was enough. <laughs> what uh, was your first session like? Yeah, let's go chronologically. Uh, my first session I attended, I think that's the one I also pre- uh, predicted I was going to attend, uh, maybe the, the prequel to this uh, episode, mm-hmm. was the session with Alan Gates on an Apache Hive-based data warehouse. And I went in there not really knowing what to expect because I sit uh, in a world now at Microsoft with the Azure environment that have a lot of people with data warehouses that want to embrace the Hadoop thing. And it's very hard to talk to those two sides and make them understand the differences, what works and doesn't work. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my, my hope was that uh, the session would give me some, some, I don't know, hooks to, to use in those kind of conversations. Didn't quite turn out that way. What Alan actually did was just uh, explain how Hive and LLAP and all that uh, stuff can be used in a data warehouse kind of uh, way of thinking. So he presented that uh, content with the spectacles, let's say, of a data warehouse person. So if you're expecting this, that, you can do that. And, and was that all the way from sort of data ingest and ETL all the way no, through to presentation? No, see, that's, that's the problem. It was only, it was mostly Hive, which is, of course, his main uh, expertise, obviously. Mm-hmm. So it was mainly Hive, LAP, and a couple of other things. So he did have a kind of a broad diagram, but from the start, he said, I don't have time to cover everything, so these things in the, in the periphery I won't touch up on too deep. So... Uh, Missed that a little bit. On the other hand, the thing he did talk about, things he did talk about, were very interesting and very, mm-hmm. very nice to hear. So he gave some uh, uh, statistics from the uh, Yahoo Japan uh, test they did with LAP with uh, some numbers, some statistics. He also gave a couple of benchmarks against uh, Hive One with Heads versus Hive Two with uh, LAP. Mm-hmm. He gave comparisons between uh, Hive and Impala, comparisons between Hive and uh, was it Presto? I think it was Presto. Yeah. And just showing and being very honest about it that the TCPD, whatever the, the acronym of the, the, the benchmark is, I forget. forget yeah, the, TCPDS. The Thank you. See, that's why Dave is Dave. Uh, and he was very honest. Say, okay, I, I, I kind of cut off the graph where it became not so good for us anymore, but these are the majorities which are better. He never tried to say, this is the best thing. LRP does everything better than everybody else. No, but it's a step in the right direction. It shows us that we're going in the right direction without becoming an MP, uh, MPP. Because yeah. we're still not a parallel data warehouse. Hive is still not MPP. It's still MapReduce, basically, not MapReduce, Java MapReduce, but the algorithm, the, the, the approach to it. So it still scales horizontally without any issues. Yeah. And we can really approach same kind of uh, quality, same kind of speed as a Impala, yeah. which is MPP. So that was basically the message. Like, again, don't replace stuff. Stuff works well. Keep what works well. But this thing is going the right way. Keep an eye on it. It's happening. Nice. So that was good. Um, um, you also went into things like uh, if you go to cloud, which was important for me, the storing uh, data in cloud is different because HDFS has different uh, ways of working with that. And the assumptions that Hadoop makes, the software makes, aren't really in sync with cloud things because a move operation, never even thought about that, in Linux is free. Mm-hmm. It's just a change in your I know table, right? Yeah. In block store, it isn't. You actually do a copy. Uh, a copy and a delete. Yeah. yeah. Or even a copy and leave the rest and forget the delete, but you have to wait till the copy is finished. 
and the software doesn't really take that into account. Uh-huh. So that's also things that there was some points he gave, he made here when you go to cloud, take these things to account. So it was a nice session. Uh, if you haven't seen it, then uh, if you weren't there, I would definitely recommend going to the online slides and the video. Yes, yeah. I've seen everybody, everything being videotaped, so I'm assuming it's all going to go online. Yeah, should definitely be. go there. Now at the end of the session, he finally touched on the real data warehouse things, uh, the things called all up cubes. Mm-hmm. which is what I was waiting for. <laughs> uh, but basically all he said there was, uh, there's a thing called Druid, and that's going to do your data cubes and get a very high level. I'm not going to go into that because the next session after this one I visit was the Druid session, so I'm going to go more depth on Druid there as far as I can go into depth on that. There was also a mention of AdScale, which is a commercial, uh, let's say, a variant of what Druid does. Also, it doesn't do the same way at all because AdScale basically takes a, a subset of your data from the Hadoop cluster into their own environment, commercial environment, as an OLAP cube, and then can get data from Hadoop if it's not in the cube already. Yeah. To uh, update their caches, let's say. So it's a different approach because Druid totally works in Hadoop itself. But uh, that was also nice of him to just say you have Druid that does it. But there's also other opportunities, other things out there. So again, very open, very nice, uh, very nice talk. Excellent, excellent. Um, yes. So I, as I mentioned, I was in a customer meeting through throughout the first session. So on to session two then, um, which uh, by by hook or by crook. Um, we both ended up in the same session. Um, <laughs> True. We'll <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about uh, about some of the reasons why uh, when we do our daily recap. But uh, so in this case, it was um, Hive and Druid integration, and as uh, as Jon mentioned, really kind of a session following on from um, the, the the previous session around uh, Hive and the data warehouse. But this session purely focused around uh, around Druid. And you know the areas where it can significantly uh, help and accelerate your um, uh, your interaction with that sort of data. Um, one of the things that I hadn't really uh, realized before or taken account of before, I've been so I, I know a little bit more about the at scale solution and what they can do with OLAP cubing, and I hadn't really realized that uh, Druid was primarily optimized. Uh, essentially for time-based um, sort of time series style uh, data. And that seems to be one of the areas where it's more focused. I'm not entirely sure if that's the focus of Druid or the focus of the demonstrations we saw today. Because uh-huh. uh, doing a time, a time series demonstration is very easy because the fun thing was you could just put a timestamp in there and then ask the thing, give me everything within the last 10 minutes or something. It, it, it automatically inferred periods and uh, time passed and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, I, I need to look into it more deeply because this was a nice session, but definitely didn't go as deep as I was, would have liked to. And then it would have taken hours anyway, so yeah. impossible. Yeah. But I do think it can do more than the, what the guy showed us. Because when he also talked about how he made a Druid table from a Hive table, where your data still is in Hive, but you have a Druid virtual table that accesses that data, yeah. he talked about how the uh, f- uh, numerical fields became values, mm-hmm. but the string fields became dimensions. And then uh-huh. OLAP cube, a dimension, is a queryable thing. It's an aggregatable thing. That's what the dimensions do in a cube. That's what the cube is, basically, right? It's a 3D yeah. environment. And then he showed the timestamp example. But the things he had in there he had a sales table with the products and some other stuff in it, which were not time-related at all. So no. there must be more in there than just timestamps. Uh, okay. So you you reckon maybe it's the, the, sort of the suite of demos they're using right now just focus towards that? It's an easy demo to do, I think. And yeah. to be quite honest, if all they can do is the time stuff, that's not an OLAP cube. Yeah, yeah. And it could, I mean, it could also be that that's, that's just what they're focusing on for the first part of the implementation as it's back-ending Hive. It's a very young product. So I've got some version numbers here. Apparently, the thing I didn't know is that Druid is becoming part of HTTP. So it's going to be shipped with 2.6.0, which was released yesterday. Yep. Congratulations, HTTP. And if my vision doesn't betray me, apparently Apache 2.3 is using Druid 0.9.2 using Apache CalSite 1.12.0. Just reading stuff off here. I didn't even know it used uh, CalSite behind yeah, the scenes either. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Druid 0.9.2, so they're still below the 1.0 release, release. So, yeah, maybe things are still coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are a few other interesting pieces of that uh, particular session. 
Um, one was talking about how the data was actually stored in, in segment files, mm-hmm. uh, partitioned by time. Um, and that ideally that you should aim for those segment files to be smaller than uh, one gig. And if they are larger than one gig, then essentially you need to split your partitions into smaller um, smaller batches in order to try and optimize that sort of yeah. uh, that sort of file size. I thought that that was quite quite nice. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing I hadn't realized was that um, Druid is essentially interacted with um, through a REST REST based API where both the queries that you make and the results that you get back are essentially expressed in JSON. I hadn't. I hadn't done enough digging into it to know that, um, so that was useful to understand. Yeah, that's below the covers, right? You basically, yeah. if you use it, you don't see that. Yeah. That's how it's uh, communicated internally. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, also, so they also talked about you need a MySQL database to store the metadata for uh, Druid. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping they're going to merge that with the Hive Meta Store, which already is a SQL store somewhere. I would guess so. Yeah. It mean having another external database to to support your databases. <laughs> yeah. It gets a bit much at the end, so but that's again the integration of Hive and Druid is going forward apparently. They're going to remain yep. separate uh, projects, I would assume. I would think I don't so. See yeah. any reason to to join them, but the integration should get better all the time now. So, uh looking forward to it and apparently the long-term view for the people who to who some to whom this says something is to support materialized views in Hive, which yeah. would be very nice. Yeah. If they can do that then we really have <laughs> Yeah, what what else do you need in the day in the data warehouse? Yeah, you have whole lab materials for materials for use. Uh, speeds going up as well. Yeah, this is really I mean, obviously, work. we need to add a couple more zeros to the price because otherwise, that's the only difference. Oh, that's the problem. <laughs> oh, it's never going to be in our uh, sorry uh, that data warehouse. <laughs> so the other the other thing that uh, I thought was was really nice about the way that they've done this interaction so far is that it's um, you know it, it, it's dynamic on how much processing is done in Hive and how much is done on Druid, depending on what the uh, uh, what the overall situation is. So, uh, And that's the work of CalSite to decide on that uh, that split um, between the, the processing. Yeah. I, I just think it's, it's a, it seems like something that's been really well thought out. Yeah. It seems so far, yes, it's early days, but it seems to be you know, really nicely yeah, executed. Nice so I, I, I'm looking forward to see what the next kind of 12 to 18 months... Uh, shows yeah, for it. Yeah, they had a nice, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, slogan. Uh, I'd say, uh, whatever query you throw at it, even if we can't do it in Druid, it must happen. It must yeah. pass. Yeah, but that's that's always uh, that's always been the, if you like, the Horton Works kind of approach is that you you should wherever possible you you, you can be you can be fast, great, but make sure you've got one hundred percent success. Mm. It's no good. Being fast on you know eighty percent of the queries and then you know blowing Breaking up after ones, yeah. after thirty seconds on on the rest of yeah. them. Well, let's call the away open source works. Not yeah, open. let's 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 do that. Let's do that. Anyway, um, so after that, it was lunch, I believe. I have no idea because in my little notes I did not note lunch because I didn't take lunch. I had so many people I met again since last year. So I had a lot of talks and a lot of people coming up to us and telling us that we're doing apparently a good job with the podcast. Thank you very much for that. That yeah, really, yes. really does us good. Yeah, very much so. Anybody that came up and talked to us and uh, either thanked us for the podcast or asked us questions about the podcast or even just uh, acknowledged that uh, they, they'd listened to us before, Thank you so much because it really does make a difference um, to, uh, to to us and to hearing that and to recording these sessions. So, on the other hand, it does make us make more of these. So, if you want <laughs> us to stop, <laughs> yeah, if you want us to stop, tell us to stop. <laughs> okay, okay, let's not dwell on that. Yeah, let's go yeah. on. Let's go on. So, um, uh, yeah, next session I got uh, ten past two. So, yeah, that's after lunch. Yep. And I went to the Hadoop 3 in a nutshell session, which, of course, was for me the session to go to yeah. this, uh, this event because Hadoop 3 is around the corner. There's a lot of new stuff in there. And I got mixed feelings about this session because it was, on one hand, a very good session, but a very full session. Yeah. The person, had, the, the presenter, had so much to talk about and went so fast that at a certain point I had to disconnect because I couldn't keep it in my head anymore. I tried to make notes, but it's a total jumble. Couldn't even type it up anymore fast enough. I just started scribbling notes on a notepad and stuff. 
But basically, he was going across all the things that are going to change with uh, the 3.0. And he had one nice slide at the beginning, which I was able to follow still, <laughs> about why the, na- the number change. Because mm-hmm. we've had uh, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.6, and now 2.0. Well, maybe 2.7 will happen as well. We don't know that. But why yeah. are we going to 2.0? It had a couple of reasons on the screen. None of and their, and themselves were really good enough to make it a 3.0, except one. We'll go into in a second. Mm-hmm. But just the number of changes they had was enough to just, let, let's make it a clean slate and have some backwards breaking things, which means we have a 3.0 release. Yeah. Because basically what things are changing is uh, the JDK is going to version 8 only. Yeah. So we're going to drop uh, JDK 7 support, which in itself isn't enough to make a major number change because it's a, a dependency that changes. Not, and that yeah. and J- yeah. JDK 8, it's not young anymore. I mean, 7 was deprecated in 2015 or something? Something like that, yeah. So Please. people are still running that. Anyway, so that was a change. But basically the thing that I... Uh, took home as being the reason for three to though is that their uh, command scripts are changing are be, being no longer compatible with the old versions so you can install uh, something from the three from the version three three yeah <laughs> you will not be able to have the scripts being compatible with uh, the, the old version uh, script so that makes right. it a breaking change yeah that, that would make the, sense the major one Apart from that, uh, what else did he talk about? Uh, what was in 3.0, of course? Uh, HDFS, big change, erasure coding. Yeah. Again, not enough to make the 3.0 release, but with the JDK and the command script changing. And this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so erasure here. coding, just for anyone that's not familiar. I can't explain that, but go ahead. Uh, well, you know, too slow. Anyway, <laughs> erasure coding, for those that, that, that may not be familiar, is essentially using the similar style of uh, processing that you see on things like uh, RAID controllers, mm-hmm. where essentially you're storing the, the data and the parity bit of data. Um, to So in order to get the same level of um, replication of data, uh, within HDFS, you just copy the data three times across three different data nodes, and that's good. Um, with erasure coding, you essentially reduce that uh, replication of data uh, by uh, 1.5x. So you're only replicating the data uh, 1.5 times uh, to get the same level of resiliency. Now, there is a slight penalty paid um, in terms of uh, the compute power that's required to uh, reconstitute, if you like, that data back again on read and obviously to write it down in the first place. Um, but incredibly useful for um, archive and, and cold data use cases. I've also seen some very, very early benchmarks, and I've yet to be convinced of this, but there are apparently certain use cases where, um, because of the way it's stored, uh, you'll actually get certain benefits in terms of processing because you're reading less data in the first place anyway. Yeah, the reading gets slower. Uh, actually, he gave us some numbers about that as well, and he said 1.4 to 1.6 times uh, uh, over yeah, over, yeah. over usage. Yeah. So 1.5 is in the middle there. Yeah. <laughs> And apparently, what they're doing is storing three parity uh, bytes for every or blocks for every. So he had the example with nine blocks in total, six data blocks with three parity blocks. Yeah. So you still have a possible three failures before you actually lose data, yeah. which makes it more secure than the simple three times over yeah. replication. Nice. Uh, he did also say that you should restrict use of erasure coding to cold or archival data only. Yeah. Because apart from what you were talking about, there's also the rest of the things that your three times replication factor gives you like you'll probably get a free node where that block resides you can lose that so placement of your jobs becomes harder yeah if a node drops out in the in the, in the replication idea you don't really care because in the background it's going to get replicated and that's just a copy block that's just a read it once and spread it out again yeah in this case you have to recalculate the block yeah. So you have to read all the nine, in this example, all nine, or at least six of those uh, to recalculate the missing one. Yeah. And then write it out again. So you get more of a read-write uh, battle going on there. So mm-hmm. losing a node will cause more network traffic and more compute overhead. Yeah. So yeah. if you do it on uh, hot data, which is used all the time, that might just be not what you want. Very good point. So that's also stuff. And at this point, I started losing the threads, I must admit. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I went to real depth on the whole, uh, how it works on uh, the erasure coding stuff. Uh, also, things that changed in 3.0, of course, uh, the yarn that changed to support long-running services. 
Mm-hmm. He didn't went into any detail there because the next session that I attended there as well was a specifically a yarn session, which explained all that. So he had the yarn person sitting next to him and they were kind of looking at each other. Yeah, I'm doing that next day session. So he just went over that. Mm-hmm. And that was a bit everything I had noted with the changes. So basically that's the whole session. But he went to in enormous depth and detail on every little aspect. Everything I just mentioned, that was a whole pack of slides, a lot of text and a lot of information really in depth. So I'm really looking forward to get that slide deck. Yeah. And I'm going to study. I'm gonna, it's going to be my nightly reading material for a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, those those kind of sessions are always um, incredibly valuable from that perspective. It's, it's the kind of session that uh, I will probably, you know, I'll definitely grab the slides and I'll probably watch probably several times. Um, <laughs> on, on slow speed. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, but yeah, no. I, this is typically one of the sessions I would usually not go see at the event, but look on YouTube specifically for this reason. Yeah. But because this was, this is just to do to you though. I need to know now. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. this is so hot, you, you, I couldn't just wait. So yeah, I, uh, I'll double up. Fantastic. So what was your, what was your joy for this slot? Uh, uh, my joy for that slot was another customer meeting. So <laughs> yeah, there we go. You see, that's just Dave giving up on you, dear listener. So send an <laughs> email to dave at roaringalphan.org and just chastise him. <laughs> <laughs> on to the next. Uh, yeah, I need to look at my calendar again because that's on my phone, which just went to sleep again. Okay, okay. as I just said <laughs> a second ago, my next uh, session was the yarn session, mm-hmm. which I was hoping was going to talk about yarn tree dodo, or at least the yarn in Hadoop tree dodo. Uh, which wasn't detailed in the, in the summaries, but yes, it was. So I'm happy about that one. Now this session was a little less, uh, a little more relaxed, so not uh, not as fast going. So sadly, well, sadly, it's not a sadly thing, but he didn't really tell me much. I didn't know. Apparently, I knew more about this than I thought. I mm-hmm. have been reading up on it. On you've heard us talk about it on previous shows as well. So I pretty much knew most of this already. Uh, the one revelation for me, uh, I had some t- somewhere in my mind that the way that Yarn was going to do long-running services was with Docker. Mm-hmm. And that's not the case insofar that you can do Docker or something called, and now I have to look in my notes and I can't find it, of course, um, something, something, something which does long-term, long-time services in Yarn. So you don't need Docker to have the long-running services up and running in Yarn. It's just an okay. option if your service is in a Docker container. Yeah. Well, you asked a Hortonworks apparently, or at least the, the, the Yarn people, to support Docker, and they've listened and they're going to do that. But it's not a must, and I didn't know that. I always had in my mind that Docker was a... Uh, necessity if you wanted to have these services running. And when we're talking about long running services, he gave a couple of examples and the, 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 the simplest one is simple, a, a web service, a website that gives you the results of your calculations. You have a big batch query running, which then has to be consumed. The easy way to consume these results is just put it on a website somewhere yeah. or a REST API or something. And you couldn't really have that running on your Hadoop cluster because that's a website that needs to be up all the time and can't just disappear. So Yarn didn't really work well for that. Well, this should could be one of those services. Okay. Another service uh, example he gave was the Hadoop services themselves, Hive Server Two, the Name Node Server, the Region, uh, the Resource Manager. Those are long running services which are not being covered by Yarn today, because Yarn can't do long running services. So those will also become Yarn queues. Interesting. Uh, also, Yarn is getting a totally new uh, renewed UI. Mm-hmm. If you go to the, the Yarn page itself, you have a lot more dials and stuff, and you kind of need it because the whole yeah, paradigm is changing, so what they had really didn't work anymore. And that UI is also becoming a long-running service running in a Yarn container, <laughs> which means that if you're doing a lot of monitoring, you will no longer cause resource contention on Yarn itself. Fantastic. So there's a lot of elegance in the whole solution apparently yeah, it looks like. yeah, yeah. this is very nice because that usually if you see elegance in computing it means some someone's doing something right yeah <laughs> nice nice very nice so i'm going all over the place here this is not how he chronologically went through his uh, items but i'm just looking if anything else pops out that i want to talk about uh zuki yeah that's a nice one as well if you go in with long running, uh, long running services, you need a discovery mechanism. You need to be able to have your worker node or your, your, your worker jobs, let's call them that, and figure out where that service is. So you need some kind of 
queryable, tell me where your IP address is. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be also in there. Zookeeper is going to do part of that. It's going to be a DNS-based solution with Zookeeper in there. I didn't really fathom completely what the underlying logic behind that was, something I need to look into, but uh, that's already that's also in the plan. That's, that's there. That's going to happen too. That was very nice as well. And he kind of finished off with a nice, uh, a nice slide where they had yarn at the bottom and then running MapReduce and Spark and whatever on yarn. And then you could, of course, have Docker containers on yarn as well now because mm -hmm. yarn's going to support Docker. And those Docker containers could do things like, for example, TensorFlow. Yeah. And those Docker containers could do something like run yarn. Hmm. And that yarn can then run MapReduce and Spark <laughs> and Docker containers. Oh, God, we've got Inception. <laughs> yes. And apparently it's actually something that happens every day at Hortonworks. Because we talked about was the, the way that Hortonworks is testing their new versions is on the Y cloud, the yeah. yarn cloud, which is actually a Dockerized environment on top of yarn where they spin up X amount of uh, cluster, Hadoop clusters do the tests and everything. So yeah. it's nice to see them eating their own dog food or drinking their own champagne. Let's make it a nice uh, yeah, uh, version doesn't. of it. So that was also a nice thing. And just see what he finished off with. Yeah, things that they are looking forward to in the future mm -hmm. is something called resource profiles, which I didn't really care what that was going to be, but that's something. Something called Yarn Federation, because apparently having thousands of nodes is enough. They want to have tens of thousands of nodes now. Yeah, why not? Oh, why not indeed? And the last one, I can't even read my notes anymore. But there was something with a scheduler, and it's not garbage, but a gang scheduling. Also, a thing which I have multiple explanations for, and I didn't really capture the one he was there talking about. So, fair enough. But that's future talk, not in there yet. All in all, very useful session. I actually talked to the person to see if we could get him on the show. He seemed to be responsive to that. So, with a bit of luck, we'll have the experts talking about this in more depth soonish. Excellent. Excellent indeed. So, I think that brings us to uh, session five. Um, and uh, so, I was, uh, again, um, unable to attend my uh, first choice. And again, we'll talk about that later. Detecting a pattern here. Um, uh, but I, it's, I was able to attend. I had I had very closely uh, um, closely fought as to which session I would attend here. So it was no it was no great uh, no great shame at all. Uh, and I attended a session by uh, Priyank Shah, who um, the session was actually labelled in the agenda streamline um, streaming analytics management. Um, but it it turns out that something be between the time when the talk was submitted and now uh, the naming of this project has changed. So it's now called Sam, the uh, Streaming Analytics Manager, and um, essentially uh, Sam is all about the fact that we have a bunch of very competent technologies for real time streaming of data. I don't think anyone would argue uh, to the contrary, apart from John, when he's feeling sort of... I never angry. argue. Um, but one of the problems that we often see, and in, to a certain extent you could say, um, if you look at something like, uh, like NiFi, um, which admittedly has been around for a long time now, um, it, people get somewhat spoiled. They, they look and they see and they use... Uh, NiFi and they, they they look at that experience and there are very few things in the um, streaming analytics uh, world that are quite so nice to use. So um, the idea was the idea behind Sam, the streaming analytics manager, was why not bring that NiFi drag and drop look and feel um, to a lot of existing technologies that we know and love, like. Um, Spark streaming in the future, but today Storm and Kafka. Um, so the 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 sort of the core concept here was really um, Sam provides um, an overlying sort of uh, web UI um, that talks through uh, a standardized API to a bunch of different um, streaming engines that are on the back end of it. Now. Uh, as I mentioned, it's um, it's really uh, designed to um, sort of separate 
the operational workflow from everything else that's that's happening underneath. But there's there's multiple different components to it. So there's essentially um, a, a streaming operations piece, which is to deal with um, set, you know, managing environments and pools of resources. Um, you've got a stream builder, does exactly what it says on the tin, allows you to drag in a, a Kafka queue that uh, that's going to that's going to provide you some data. Um, drag in a second one. Drag in a, a join operation that will join the data from those queues. Select how you want to join it. Drag in um, uh, another operation um, that will apply a, a sort of a filter to the data, or a um, or a regression, or you know some other sort of operation, and so on. Um, then there's this something called the the stream insight, um, which allows you to sort of get a dashboard, if you like, for what's happening in this uh, in this streaming environment when everything's running. So you get um, the sorts of things that are being presented uh, by things like the Storm UI and the Kafka um, sort of dashboard underneath. Those metrics surfaced up um, to this uh, Streaming Insight Manager. So... Um, Really quite interesting. Um, there was a little bit of talk also about uh, something else that's coming down the line, which is the schema registry. And so, for example, because of the integration between the schema registry, much in the similar way that you can um, go and look at the uh, provenance of um, events in NiFi, with, with this, you could go and see the schema at any given point in time through the flow. So, for example, if you've got two sets of data coming in on two separate Kafka streams and you, you've got a, a, join, a streaming join process that's happening between them, then obviously the, the schemas between those points are going, to be, are going to be different than if you're enriching it from something else. Again, the schema is going to change again. And all of this, this uh, schema registry keeps a track of all of this that's happening in the background. Um, okay. The whole premise for me for Hadoop is to have... Uh, it's the old scheme on read, scheme on write uh, story. Yeah. Now, this sounds dangerously like having a schema on write. Um, or am I just wrong? Uh, sort of. Mostly you're wrong. But <laughs> um, but no, the, the, so the idea is more about ensuring that you can be flexible and you can evolve your schema without without. I mean, literally, the schema was evolving as the messages were flowing through the through the platform. That's how dynamic it was. If you'd added something else in, it would have adjusted the schema on the fly, and he, and again versioning the schema as it runs through. So it's but it still need to have the original schema of the stream that comes in to be able to join merge it with the schema of the second stream that comes in to make it a unified schema schema version two, let's say. So how does it get that original schema information? You have to give it that, or does it infer that from the data? It, it infers it from the data. That's one of the things. That's so the schema is more of a data types only thing. Uh, so data types, and then you can overlay it with meaning. Uh, but if you overlay it, overlay it with meaning, it means that you, data wrangler, have to do some kind of yeah nail down the schema. This is the schema, and from this point, it has to conform to the schema, or else I won't. No, no, that's but the, the whole point in this is if you change it, as long as it doesn't break something down the line. And obviously, there are certain elements of this that you know, if you if you're joining on a certain field and you remove that field, well, yeah, that's that's going to fundamentally break mm-hmm. things. Uh, but you can add more fields to it, and it will just carry on working. Yeah, still, it feels it still feels like a bit of a regression to me. And don't ask me why, but. <laughs> Well, all I can say is um, it was a very, very good session. Um, the there were some some surprising things about it in that it actually had a uh, quite a reasonable visualization engine to it as well, which was based on a, a project that I I had not come across before, and it doesn't look like I made a note of it, um, but. It was just a. It was really quite interesting. I'm very, very curious to see how this develops. Um, the The focus um, seemed to be there was strong interest in bringing other streaming engines under the same under the same banner, and you know, this is not going to replace 
the need to go and manually code a whole bunch of stuff. And that was going to be a question I had because it sounds to me like it's more of a workflow definition, monitoring, maybe even alerting tool. But if I look at Storm, if I could have a Storm Bolt, that's some deep and nasty Java code. There's no, no but going- this is creating that on the fly. That's the whole point of it. So you can get, uh, there are a whole bunch of operations that it has natively built in that it's able to do. And um, so things like, so things that it can do to con- um, basic primitives are things like uh, joining streams, connecting streams, forking them, aggregations over Windows, a variety of different streaming analytics. There are about, I don't know, 15 or 20 um, streaming analytics things that are built into it. Um, descriptive, predictive you know, rules that you can run, transformations. And then you've also got the option to have a completely customized primitive as well. So you can customize that in terms of providing it code that you then want it to run. Okay. So it's, uh, I don't think yet it's going to completely replace. Yeah, because I can imagine if I want to call my machine learning algorithm through PMML, you're going to have uh, to do some It supports manual. that. Yeah, but it doesn't know what my model is going to be. I just just take any serialized PMML code and plop it in there. Correct. Um, okay. So, as I say, I don't think it's, it's yet going to replace mm-hmm. people natively writing things. But I also know that a lot of people that are using Storm and Kafka are doing relatively simple yep. things with it, at least when they're getting started. And I think this could, at the very least, significantly accelerate their their initial journey and, and, and not when just people their get, journey but a uh, storm journeys as well because one of the biggest limiting factors of, of using storm is the complexity of getting started with it yeah so if this yeah. can take away that burden um, it'll accelerate all the other projects that it can help as well yeah and literally the the guy started out with a blank screen and then punched in an ambari um url into it gave some credentials so he could connect to it and then it you know it imported all the resources the Zookeeper, the Storm, the Kafka, and the HGFS, and and away it went. It was, I was pretty impressed. And I, does it also have the same kind of governance backend that Nightfly has? Uh, no, so it doesn't yet. But um, if you think about it, it's also interacting with all of the underlying tools. So as long as things like Kafka and Storm support uh, Atlas integration, which they do then all of those things are largely taken care of. Now, what it doesn't have is, um, you know, they're looking to add things like proper, um, you know, role-based access control to it and, and things like that. So that's coming down the line. Um, it would be access control to the interface itself, not correct. to the underlying stuff, because the, the underlying Storm would stuff. have it, but Spark, exactly. for example, Spark Streaming doesn't have range. Correct, stuff, yeah. correct. So, yeah, I, a nice session. I would thoroughly recommend anyone that's looking at any sort of streaming workloads to take a look at it. How production ready is this? Is this something I can just deploy today and work uh, in next month, over a year? Uh, how? Uh... I, I get the feeling that it's something that you'll see in the sort of Hadoop 3.0 time frame okay. has become... Um, whether it'll whether it'll you'll see it earlier than that as tech preview and, and come the sort of 3.0 time frame, it'll be GA... I don't know. It'd be something like that. It looked yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty pretty reasonably feature complete today. I'm sure there's plenty of work to do still. Yeah. But and the whole real time streaming stuff are long running services which need to be in the new yarn anyway. For yeah. Apple in the new yarn. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Quite uh, quite pleasing to uh, discover to something it. new. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> um, I I knew a little bit about it already, but it, it was the first time I'd uh, been able to. Um, see it in full form. Anyway, how about you? What was uh, your session like during... Uh... Uh, my next one, uh, we're talking the 1610 time Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, I went to the Apache Atlas Governance for your data session, uh, mm-hmm. mainly because I wanted to get a lay of the land of what the current state of uh, Atlas was. We've been talking on the podcast before that the evolution, the the the, the, the uh, it's, it's not going fast enough as far as I'm concerned. Atlas should have been, should do a lot more today for reasons, it's... For reasons. <laughs> I mean, I can want, but people have to still write the stuff as well. And I know yeah. it's open source and I should do it myself, but yeah, I'm not that good. Yeah, patches are welcome, Jan. Patches are welcome. I'm not that good. 
So basically, I, that's the reason I went there, just to see what the changes were, if I've missed anything. And basically, I have not. There have been some incremental upgrades, changes. The UI has been built out, fleshed out a bit more. Uh, the UI I remember have seen a year ago was a lot more beta, let's say. This was something that looks well, pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Functionality-wise, I didn't see much changes at all. Uh, he did have one nice slide that had the whole... Uh, let's say architecture of uh, uh, Atlas on the on the on the board, where the uh, which components could generate metadata, how they were stored, where they actually used the Kafka queue to capture those things yeah, and send them right. to the API, and it's all getting stored in a graph database on Titan still. Yeah. Um, okay. Fair enough. And underneath uh, that, they're storing it in HBase and Solar, so they can actually use the free text uh, search during Solar and HBase for all of the tagging lookups, I'm assuming. Yeah. So that was the one thing that I liked. I made a nice uh, drawing of it <laughs> for future <laughs> reference. But apart from that, if you know what uh, high, what uh, Atlas does, you will not have missed anything. Just see if I have anything else noted here. Uh, he did uh, give us a roadmap. Things are going to look up in the future for, and yeah, they're going to add business taxonomies. Yeah, on the one hand, Atlas always touted that they were not going to do that to make it open and free, and now they're exp experiencing the fact that it's hard to use because it doesn't have a taxonomy, so they're yeah. going to be adding stuff. Which is nice. Going to, I mean, it's not because they have to use it, but if it's not there, you can't use it. So give people the choice to use it. Put it in. Yeah. Um, adding connectors, of course. Uh, HBase is still on the roadmap. Uh, Knife and Spark should be around the corner or there already. Although Knife, as far as I know, doesn't have it yet in production mm, GA versions. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, on the hive, they want to do a uh, column level lineage. Which apparently is already available. There was a customer, uh, customer, a uh, audience question about that. Apparently, if you have the right version of Hive and the right kind of table and the right kind of thing, it's something already in Atlas, but it's not across the board yet. So that's coming. Uh, better searching and filtering on lineage. So an export import of Atlas uh, to something I can't read anymore. It doesn't matter. Those are basically uh, UI improvements on how you can leverage what Atlas has in its uh, knowledge uh, database. Let's say. Yep. Um, yep. So part of that, just Atlas, as I uh, know and uh, hope to keep on loving it. Indeed. Did uh, it talk at, at all about the APIs and the changes there? Uh, no, they did talk about it had an API, of course, and you can use it, and that Scoop can integrate and stuff like that. So, but, I mean, uh, no the, changes, no. the reason the reason I mention is that the API, I I know this from from having uh, attended other sessions. Um, that they made significant changes to the APIs uh, in this latest release of Atlas um, to the point where um, there is a fairly uh, large uh, organization that is looking to uh, delve very heavily into the, the Atlas well. And um, the, the one of the primary reasons that they've been holding off to this point was that the APIs were just not complete enough and not strong enough across mm -hmm. the board for them to do so. Uh, this latest iteration has uh, significantly overall overhauled the APIs, and in fact, if you know the right way, uh, the right place to uh, poke about on the internet, you can actually find the uh, fully swaggerized API documentation um, for this uh, this kind of uh, this release of Atlas as well, um, which is which is incredibly useful. You know, giving you the ability to you know test API calls and all that sort of thing through a web mm -hmm. UI. So. Yeah, the, the one thing I did miss was when Atlas was started, they went about this is going to be a not just Hadoop only, but across the whole ecosystem in the company with Hadoop and everything else. And that was the API's intended usage so that all of the other people could hook into the API and add their metadata and uh, attribute-based uh, checking, whatever, in there. That was completely absent in this uh, session. So it looks like... At the moment, at least, the ambitions of Atlas have been reduced to let's just get this Hadoop thing working and have the API there. So if anybody wants to use, they can. But there was no... Yeah, I, was I, by. I, I think you may have dreamt that. But What did I dream? The, the, the concept of Atlas for all. Um, uh, I've seen demos. I've seen demos uh, given to customers. No, I, I think... But there's a difference between um, enabling an open API so that people can consume it if they mm -hmm. want to yeah, but the hope was that that would happen. Yeah, I, okay. Well, anyway, I still think you <laughs> dreamt it. 
Um, so no, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, you did. No. Moving on, moving on. See, that's his reply. When he can't win the argument, he just moves on. That's right. And I don't. Cutting Yon. No, he just carries on talking and talking and talking and talking. Anyway, um, session six. Um, this one for me um, was the uh, the file format wars session, and uh, this was session by uh, Owen O'Malley, and uh, you know it really just covering um, Avro, JSON, uh, Orc file, Parquet, and you know, giving some actual metrics of um, how these different file formats perform. Yeah, whatever. Who's, who won? Who's the best? Yeah, I don't know because <laughs> I had to leave after about 27 minutes because I had another customer meeting, um, which I'm really Come gutted on, about. Come on, you can't leave the suspense like this. <laughs> so I can, I just did. Um, so what I would say, though, is that um, the, the, there were several things that were very, very useful about this. Um, one of the things that was mentioned at the start, actually, was around TPCDS. Uh, yes, Jan, I can still remember what it's called. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that he mentioned is that, actually, it's great for benchmarking. If you're benchmarking you know, a platform, TPCDS, fantastic. It's actually very bad for testing file formats, though, because of the types of data they chose it actually compresses unrealistically well. So worth noting, if you're looking at uh, benchmarking stuff and you're also interested in a variety of different file formats, don't use that. So what should you use? Well, let me tell you. Um, the slides then went on and Owen went then on to talk about a variety of different data sets that you could use. Okay. So one was um, all of the data uh, from uh, New York City taxi rides every single taxi ride from 2009 onwards, and uh, that produces a rather nice uh, data set. Um, and uh, the second one was uh, all actions performed on GitHub. Um, <laughs> as you might ex- expect, the um, the New York City taxi ride is, you know, fairly reasonably structured, you know, a, a relatively limited number of fields, all, you know, no nulls and reasonably mm-hmm. well handled. Um the all actions on GitHub t- turned out being just a horrendous mess of JSON. Um, I don't remember how many fields it was, um, but essentially just the schema alone was 12K. <laughs> so, um, yeah, fairly fairly horrendous. And then the, the third data set was a set of um, – it was a valid schema, but with generated data – uh, for sales data from a, a well-known sale, uh, web-based sales company that he uh, works with on a regular basis for sort of Hadoop engineering-related topics. Um, and then it went into all of the uh, the variety of different uh, storage comparisons you'd expect. So things like uh, looking at compression, uh, looking at performance of queries, and so on and so forth. As I say... Uh, I unfortunately had to leave before the uh, the punchline and conclusion, um, but it's definitely a session I look forward to uh, catching up with uh, on YouTube later. But do you expect the punchline to be, this is the best in this scenario, this is the best in that scenario? <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah. I mean, just it, the way it was leading to is essentially, please, for the love of God, don't use JSON. Um, <laughs> oh, JSON <laughs> rocks, man. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, really slow for querying, really bad for storage performance. Anyway, um, the, really, the, there were some interesting nuances with how um, Orc and Parquet perform differently. And, you know, he, he very uh, openly said, you know, he'd spent a lot of his time in ORC file, given his background, mm-hmm. his history. But, you know, he, he really did want to understand what the differences were. Yeah. And... Uh, one of the differences, um, for example, was you know processing time versus compression that was different between um, ORC and Parquet, and the reason for that is apparently we'd done some performance tuning you know last year at some point and decided to tweak a little bit the way that compression was done in ORC to reduce the compression a little bit on certain data types to accelerate the performance of, of queries that required those kind of data types. Hmm. And it sounded like it was it was a balance that was a, a conscious decision to do that. And it certainly from a performance perspective uh, was very was very valid. 
the interesting thing though was that how once you discount like the ones that are obviously stupidly large, how relatively close all of these file um, you know, file formats were okay. in terms of size and compression. There were there were deltas, mm-hmm. and there were definitely you know Likewise. winners. Yeah. You know, but the I think the the takeaway from me not having seen the final takeaway <laughs> is essentially this is Dave's fantasy then use use a modern file format and you probably won't go far wrong yeah. I mean that's the whole thing with the open source thing right it's being used so oh, everybody's using this stuff if one was really worse than all the others it wouldn't be around anymore well yeah I mean the the uh, I think some of some of the history behind them for example ORC and Parquet that should never have happened Realistically, that was two organizations that really should have been talking to each other at that point in time. Um, they are so closely aligned. There's no reason for two file formats. And they're still but, not talking to each other. But we but we have two file formats, and there we go. Anyway. Hey, competition is good. Yeah, competition drives innovation, as we say again and again and again. That's anyway, Dave repeating himself, not me. Pretty much. Um, so, yeah, that was my uh, my session six. Moving on to session seven, then. What did I go do? I went to an approach for multi-tenancy through Apache Knox, mm-hmm. which I went to with uh, for two reasons. Uh, one being that I have been out of touch with Knox, and it's like a, a estranged uh, relative. You need to get, <laughs> knock on their door again and reacquaint yourself with it. So that was mm-hmm. a good opportunity. And also, this wasn't a pure technical thing, but apparently, uh, a couple of guys made a fun proof of concept demo situation where they made a multi-tenant Hadoop cluster through Knox. Okay. It sounded like fun. Mm-hmm. And actually, it was pretty much fun. Uh, Knox itself hasn't really changed much. They've added some more protocols to support for authentication. Uh, when I last looked at them, they did uh, SAML and OAuth and uh, Pnego and stuff like that. And now they have some, some other uh, acronyms on the board. So it's uh, growing more and more and doing... A, that's good. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's becoming a, a really nicely full-fledged application. I would still like them to make a nice admin GUI so I don't have to write all that XML. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm guessing that's for the 1.0 release. Uh, but what I actually did was build a uh, single cluster and then have two web front ends with a different URL. And every URL had their own, uh, what you might call it, is a topology in Nox, I think it's called. It's a topology, I think, mm-hmm. uh, with the URL translation to whatever the service they were looking at. But what I also did was if you came with user Bob through this web portal, then you got impersonated to Bob underscore you came from this portal. And if you came to the other portal, you became Bob underscore this other portal. And when you then did the queries on your Hadoop cluster, you were no longer Bob because the same user Bob logged in with the same account on the two websites. But on the back end, you got, uh, as you call it, impersonated by a different user idea, which meant you could put different uh, PAI rules on there, Atlas rules, range rules, whatever. And had a nice demonstration how this simply yeah, worked quite easily. Nice. So it was a practical demonstration of what Nox can do with uh, the things that we've talked about before, I think. the How can you connect to a Kerberos cluster from a non kerberos environment? Yeah. And more importantly in this demo, how can you abstract away the underlying cluster through redirections in the well, reverse proxy, what uh, yeah. Nox actually is? Yeah. So for people that know what Nox is but are a bit lost on, okay, but how do I use this thing? It's a very nice uh, video to watch just to see a end-to-end solution built on the, on the thing. Mm-hmm. The, they didn't show all the underlying stuff. They did show all the code they wrote for the web front ends and the uh, logging and uh, they could actually, they showed how the, uh, the inter- impersonation happened and stuff like that, but they didn't show the apologies themselves, which on the other hand is just a blob of XML. So it's not that important either. However, yeah. they did say that all of this source code is on GitHub somewhere <laughs> and they <laughs> promised to update their slide deck before they upload it to somewhere, get that uh, URL in there. But uh, I'm going not tomorrow because tomorrow is not a day of uh, event, of course. But I will look it up in the next couple of weeks, and if I find it, I will post it on the next episode, perhaps. Fantastic! So fun, a little thing at the end of the day, and uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, and uh, I attended another customer meeting. So, uh, what was mine? <laughs> yeah. So that uh, that kind of wraps up our coverage of the day. Yeah, no, no, I got we the will. 
I have one more session. One my more dear. whole session. Go for it. I have one more whole session. That was a very good session too. Because it's a session you were interested in as well. If you didn't have had a custom meeting, you probably have gotten there. I'm just looking up the exact name of the session because I've got just written something here. But it was called, okay, Unified, Efficient and Portable Data Processing with Apache Beam. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, Apache Beam, something you brought up a couple of episodes ago, I think. I did. I think. And uh, I talked about the last episode, I think it kind of intrigued me. You talked about Beam, I didn't know anything about Beam, so it was a session about Beam. I went to the session on Beam. Mm-hmm. That's a given from, uh, by a guy from uh, Google, because uh, Beam apparently is uh, developed by Google. The uh, reason behind that was that Beam, uh, well, let's first talk about what Beam is, or yep. what my impression is that what Beam is, because I really don't, I'm not an expert on it yet. But apparently it's a abstraction layer, so you can write your business logic in one way and then change how it's being used in a batch versus micro batch versus streaming environment. You write that easily in one kind of call them macro language if you like, but it isn't in one in the Beam language, the Beam programming API. And then you can have different runners underneath that. You compile that Beam uh, uh, code into a jar, and then you can throw the jar at your Flink, at your Spark, or at your Google Code Flow something called, and it just runs without any code changes. Okay. So, in the simplest version of it all, it would be just like Pig, a macro language that translates it into native code for something else and then runs it on that thing. But it does more than that because it supports multiple runners, as they call it, so multiple execution engines, uh, multiple schedulers, multiple yeah, Sparks. You can see Spark as a scheduler cluster management system. Yeah. And that's how you have to look at it. Because, for example, you can't use MLib in this. That's not the idea. You can use Spark, yeah. not MLib. Because MLib, Beam does not know MLib. <laughs> Now, the, he also, the question he mostly got asked was, okay, so you support these different things, so what, you support the lowest common denominator? Nope. Apparently, they have different runner, in, in, runner plug code, runner translation code for every runner they build. And at this point, he had that. It's on the website, uh, on the on the Beam website. We had a slide on that. So certain things are windowing functions are across all the runners, but yeah. other things are only available in the Google uh, Flow thing, uh, only in the Spark thing. And Spark was a little of the 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 the, the, the poor cousin, let's say. Redheaded stepchild. Yeah. yeah. I I think I remember that that uh, um, that diagram from uh, when we when we brought it up in the podcast previously. Yeah. So it was a bit of an interesting uh, session for me just to get introduced to the concept. I definitely don't have the entire knowledge in my head at this point, so it's something need to be revisited. Yep. But um, he also explained a bit why Google was doing this, because basically they built Beam, or at least the technology behind Beam, for Google Flow. And then he had a slide up where you have the, uh, let's call it proprietary Google solutions on the top side, and then the open source things that kind of, corresponded to that with uh, Spark and Flink and all the other stuff below that. Mm -hmm. And at this point, when you had to write something for the Google thing, they had to use this language, and for the open sourcing, they had the other language. And the uh, repetition of uh, effort, let's say, and Beam was their solution to just write it once, and if you want to run it there, it'll run. If you want it there, it'll run there. That was the idea behind it. And apparently, they're getting a lot of requests from other runners or potential runners to also be included into the Beam ecosphere. So they see this as a, uh, yeah, write once, uh, run everywhere solution for batch and streaming. Interesting times. It's interesting. It's uh, early days, I think, although Google apparently internally uses it already extensively. Yeah. Uh, But uh, as I said, the Spark was still not uh, up to snuff and it wasn't really clear. And it was a very long session, so we didn't have time for any questions afterwards. Also, the last session of the day, so we're getting booted out of the rooms. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's unclear to me if the burden of effort is at the runner side or at the Google side. So if I'm Spark and I want to have Spark supported under uh, this thing, do I have to write all this stuff or is Google the one that has to write, write the connecting code for that thing? So I couldn't uh, figure that one out. But uh looks like an interesting thing. It has a big pusher behind it. I mean, Google, when they set their mind to something... They usually produce something. Yeah. So uh, something to keep an eye on and maybe um, uh, devote a future podcast on. 
Indeed, indeed. And that was the end of my day. So it's interesting <laughs> you mentioned that integration piece because it's it's reminded me of something that came up during the SAM session, which was essentially uh, a similar sort of question. Obviously, SAM is also pluggable by by design. Um, and one of the questions, or one of the other features, is it has the ability to um, export its metrics to a variety of different solutions. And when I say a variety of different solutions, currently I mean uh, Ambari metrics or um, uh, OpenTSDB. And one of the questions from the audience was, "Hey, could we, um, you know, if we if we wrote some of the code, would you accept pull requests for?" you know, an interface to whatever it was, uh, some other kind of operational um, uh, metric star store. And the result I thought was a bit strange, which was, no, we probably wouldn't accept pull requests for that. But um, if you, you know, you put the, that, that code into whatever that upstream project is, then that should work fine, which to me seems a little bit weird. Shouldn't a joining code be part of the, at the project that requires it? The project that decides, I guess. I mean, yeah. on the one hand, if they don't have the resources to do it well, it's better to push it away to the other side. But I can't see I can't I can't see what the other side gains from it. Gains from accepting but, but that. That's the thing, right? I mean the beam guy apparently people are standing in line to become part of Beam, so they could easily say, Okay, then do this and you'll get in. Yeah. On the other hand, if you don't have the situation you want to you want to foster uh, find something. customers, then yeah, you have to do the work. Yeah, that's yeah, that's open source thing, right? If you want something done, nobody else does it. Do it yourself. Yeah, indeed. Right, actually, in the Beam session, also one of the, 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 the there was one question from the from uh, the audience who asked if they were going to be uh, integrating with the streaming thing you talked about, the streaming analytics manager. Thank you very much. And apparently, not at this point. Yeah. Although it's in this, when I hear you talking about the manager. It's also streaming. This is also streaming. So they would have at least a touching point somewhere. Yeah. So and I there's, think there's some sort of correlation somewhere. It could be a nice synergy, I think. But I, probably this both are too young to have looked at that kind of uh, yeah. high level integration. And also, both may suffer from an element of NIH syndrome. I guess we'll see. NIH syndrome at Google? No, <laughs> never. So that was the end of our day, and we'll yeah. be back after the music uh, to give our final impressions and wrap up the show. And we're back. Winding up the evening um, with some final thoughts uh, before... um, Wishing you a good night and heading off into the uh, into the Munich evening. Well, you might be entering the Munich evening, but I still have about uh, looking at the recording time, two hours of editing before my uh, before I can go to bed. Fantastic! Yeah, it's just fun. <laughs> so, such as the life of a roving podcast editor, recorder. Hey, this is a long and on the road trip, man. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Where, where are our roadies? Where are our groupies? Anyway, yeah, we're doing something um, wrong. <laughs> so, overall impressions, Jon. What did what did you what did you get out of the the first day here? Uh, well, I must also say that uh, before I give my first impressions, is that this is the first time again in a couple of years that I was as a visitor at the summit, where I wasn't working for one of the companies present uh, presenting or having a, a sales presence. Let's call it that way. So it was a, again a breath of fresh air for me to to be a visitor at the. Hadoop Summit, DataWorks Summit, to really uh, experience it that way again. It's it's been very helpful again. I really want to be here because I knew if you if you do, if you don't do these kind of events, you miss out on information and you will erode your knowledge. Yeah, and that's definitely been proven. Uh, been proven. I've learned a lot, and uh, people are nice. People recognize our podcast again. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Any, anyone that said hello, hello, right back at you. Um, if you are interested, we do have stickers, Roaring Elephant <laughs> stickers. Yes, very exclusive. Uh, we'll only give them out if you either promise an interview or if you give us a sound bite. Uh, so if you're interested in a Roaring Elephant sticker for your laptop, luggage, or some other purpose, 
you know, come hit us up, find us tomorrow, track us down. These are primo deluxe vinyl stickers, especially oh, yeah. made for laptop and heating. That's right. These are the best of the best. No expense spared. Um, so, uh, yeah, I agree. It was um, despite the fact that uh, I was uh, also doing double duty here, um, representing both Halton Works and the Roaring Elephant, uh, I still did find um, some really useful uh, insights throughout the day. And uh, I, you know, the, the venue, very nice. Yep. Um, the one thing that's kind of marred the day for me, at least a little bit, is uh, several times I'd wanted to attend a session and the session was already full. I, I, I can't help thinking that, um, you know, that given the, the number of people that, uh, that, we, that we're at now, really some of those rooms should have been larger. Now, um, you know, Jan and I have already had, you know, some, some discussion around this and um, a lot of them, I agree, were, were handled pretty well, either only a few people standing mm-hmm. or, uh, um, or, or just, you know, a few seats here and there, but nobody standing. And, and that's really good. But the, there were a number of sessions. That certainly the first session that I wanted to attend uh, that I couldn't was um, spark streaming and suicidal tendencies. And uh, there was a, a huge crowd of people outside that, that you know, were disappointed and, and were, were essentially turned away. So uh, if I could make a, uh, uh, a, a plea to the, uh, to the organisers, and, uh, you know, I'll be making my internal feedback <laughs> well-known as well, um, I would say, please, can we make sure that, uh, you know, we, we, we appropriately size some of the rooms and, and we don't kind of... Uh, um, we don't uh, just shrink the uh, the conference to the rooms that are available because I think we did we potentially did the audience a bit of a disservice. That being said, um, the sessions by and large are available online after mm-hmm. the event. Um, the slides are available. You know, I can't fault that. You know, even even people that are remote are able to you know take a couple of days out of work and and follow this. You know, ten days afterwards when all the sessions come live. So it's it's still pretty good. Um, but uh, I, 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 it, it just was a little bit of a fly in the ointment for me, which on otherwise, what was a really great day. Yeah, capacity planning is always a hard thing to do. Personally, I didn't experience that. I've had no issue even sitting at every um, session I went to, so just a bit of mad luck there. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But, uh, yeah, put it down to growing pains, that and the uh, occasionally dodgy Wi-Fi. But, uh, yes, especially doing the keynotes, Wi-Fi was horrible. There's everybody <laughs> in one room on one Wi-Fi access point, probably. Well, from, God, probably would be a couple there, but yeah. I couldn't even get on the Wi-Fi there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not very well done. Um, I must admit the, the, the best conference ever for um, Wi-Fi and data access has always been uh, what what was previously called the Ubuntu Developer Summit. Sadly, it, as an event, it exists no more. Uh, it's all gone virtual. But when that was run, like everybody could easily get fast internet access. They they ran their own dedicated yeah, access points. How many people were there? Twenty? No, it was <laughs> thousands of people. And they they ran their own access points into venues. Right. They ran their own dedicated internet connection. That's basically it, right? If the event itself takes on the cost and effort to do it that way, you probably can make it work. But yeah. if you just depend on the venues. Ready the venue's never ready. They will always cost balance it, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, nitpicking really. Yeah, great really day, great, great day, day today, and uh, looking forward to day two. Yeah, gonna be a bit more tired tomorrow than today because we have some more work to do, and it's already uh, closing up to eleven p.m. here. Indeed. So um, let's uh, close this off. Let's uh, one more time mention we are doing the raffle for the San Jose. Free ticket to the San Jose yes, yes, yes. Works, Data Works Summit. If you want to get uh, a ticket in that raffle, make sure you mention us on Twitter. Do something crazy out there. Make a video blog of it. Make us know that you did that so we give you the ticket for that. Uh, this is week two of this raffle. There's going to be one more week where you can get entries for that ticket and uh, ticket raffle. And then we will uh, choose the lucky winner. Indeed, we shall. Apart from that, all I can say is that we should have a next episode tomorrow. That's correct. If all goes well. And until then, please go to, very quickly, I don't have much time, www.roaringalphan.org. We can find more information, including a feedback form and the raffle rules. Important. 
You can also follow us on Twitter using the at Hadooptcast tag. You can contact us by email at podcast at roaringalpha.org with any thoughts, comments, criticisms, and other feedback. And you can just accost us in the venue halls tomorrow. Recognize us by yellow fleeces. Absolutely. Until you do that, my name is John. And my name is Dave. And we look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Indeed, tomorrow it is. See you then. Thank you.